So Frank is a veteran government science scientist who joined the USGS in 2011? 2011. Yes, we're getting a better track record with dates. Um, after stints with the National Weather Service and the US Air Force's meteorological program. He started his professional career in the Air Force, where he served in several capacities, including Satellite Acquisition Manager for Defence Meteorological Satellite Program. That's a mouthful. Yeah, sure is. <laughs> um, after retiring from the Air Force, he worked in the private sector as Senior Staff Scientist and later as Vice President at Asm Atmospheric and Environmental Research, Inc. Did I get that right? You got Excellent. it right. Excellent. Please welcome Frank. So I'm the one who's talking before you get a break. Right? Isn't that right? Okay. Now I'm going to start by saying I think I have the coolest job in the world. Okay? Up here, where it says USGS, that's the US Geological Survey, we fly the Landsat Satellite Constellation. And when I say we fly it, I mean we command it, we talk to it every day, we make sure it is flying and taking the imagery that it needs to take. That's a cool thing to wake up to every day. Here, just yesterday, I became the chair of this Committee on Earth Observation Satellites. So those people that were up here this morning that gave you that great panel, I get to work with them. Another cool part of my job. And the last part I'll talk about today is I used to be the chair of the International Charter for Space and Major Disasters. Okay, so there's things going on around the world. Bad things happen. We need to be able to respond and recover from when those things happen. There's an international organization that does that. So by the end of my presentation, you're going to know a little bit more about Landsat. You're all going to be data scientists. And you're all going to be experts in the International Charter. So here's, here's two gentlemen from the United States. This is the middle 1960s. You heard on this stage even earlier this morning that in that time, there was a really great thing going on to put people on the moon. But when you put people on the moon, I like that, when you put people on the moon, you needed to know what the terrain was. So there were extensive surveys done on what the terrain of the moon was, so that we would know where to land, where it was soft landing, hard landing, things of that nature. But that technology was not being turned back toward the Earth. Now, as I was introduced, I'm, I'm a government administrator, bureaucrat. In the government, you always have a program, and you have a funding line, and you have a way in which you do things. What these two individuals did, Stuart Udall was the Secretary of Interior back in the 1960s. William Pecora was the head of the U.S. Geological Survey. They didn't wait to have a program. They just put together an announcement that said, the time is now right and urgent to apply space technology towards the solution of many pressing natural resources problems. And they announced a program. They didn't have funding for that program. They hadn't gone through the government channels to ask for money to build that program. They said, this is important. This is what we need to do. So the innovation that they did 50 years ago, has resulted in the Landsat program. Again, I said it, it's the coolest thing to fly. The longest and most comprehensive record of the Earth's conditions ever assembled. This just gives you an idea of the satellites that we've flown over the years. Starting back in July of 72, and we're now flying Landsat 8, well actually Landsat 7 and Landsat 8 are currently up there now as our constellation. Now for your burgeoning engineers, Landsat 5, look at how long that flew. Actually 29 years, 10 months. Anybody familiar with the Guinness Book of World Records? 
right? You go look in the Guinness Book of World Records for Earth observing satellites, and Landsat 5 is going to be in that book. It lasted 29 years, 10 months, roughly. It had a design life of three years. So how did that happen? There was some great engineering that went into that, in, into that satellite. And there was technology that was reliable. There were scientists who kept pushing and pushing and pushing to get information from that system. And there was an awful lot of luck. Because when you fly satellites, there are lots of other pieces of things up there that have a tendency to want to hit you. And Landsat 5 made it through there. So with Landsat 5 and all the other Landsat systems, Back up one. Back in 2009, prior to 2009, Landsat imagery, you had to buy it to use it. And on a good year, on a good year when you're selling imagery, you'd sell maybe 20,000 images. Now we do that in less than an hour in terms of making imagery available. This past year, 17.4 million images were drawn from our archive. Now, it's not just one person, understand, okay? That's, that's Google, that's Amazon, that's Microsoft, that's foreign countries, that's scientists, that's people who just want to look and, and use the data. But there's 50 million, roughly, of these images that have been released to the world. The important part being anyone can get them anywhere, anytime, at no cost. That's another great in innovation when you built a system that you were trying to make work because you were selling imagery and then saying, no, we're going to make it free. And we did, and we're continuing to make that imagery available. So what does it look like? So the Columbia River uh, place back in the United States uh, between Oregon and Washington. So back in 1972, we took an image, clear image of that part of the world. And in 79, we took one in 2002, different systems taking different images, 2013. What's interesting about this is I can go into this image to look at the information content of that image, and it is calibrated all the way back to those original images. So when I'm looking for how the land has changed, how the land surface has evolved, what has happened, I'm not constrained because I changed sensors or I changed the way in which I did something in the technology. It's calibrated to a standard. So we have an archive that's 40 plus years going back for this imagery. So that's why it's the longest record, as I said a little bit ago, of the Earth. It's kind of like our, uh, our library. So when you do this, and you're comparing, say, 1975 to 2002, you can see that there, there might be some changes. These little round dots, uh, they're in a few different places. Those are center, center pivot irrigation systems, another interesting technology. But those are snapshots. So this is really an approach. It's kind of the selfie for those who understand. It's, it's, they took a selfie back then, OK? And, and now we're just looking at an image. Each of these images is roughly 185 kilometers by 185 kilometers. Uh, we in, in, in the business call that a scene. There's another way to look at this. So you have 185 kilometer square, and there's pixels within that imagery. Each of those pixels is about 30 meters by 30 meters. Now, if I were in the United States and said that's the infield of a baseball diamond, I'd get into a fight between the Cubs and the Indians uh, for the World Series, OK, because that's going on. But that's roughly the, uh, the size that we're able to determine where the changes are taking place. So let's look at this in a slightly different way. 
So let's take three observations of a pixel. Now we're not looking at a scene, we're just looking at one, one pixel. So in 1990, uh, we have a pixel at some level, 4,000 surface reflectance, 2,000, 10 years later, hasn't changed much. So if I'm taking that snapshot perspective, I'm saying, well, okay, I got a stable system, there's not a lot going on. And you can see in 2010, now, if I take multiple clear observations during the growing seasons, I got a few more to look at. It still looks pretty s stable. Now, you all are going to be data scientists because I want you to tell me when I put the next one up here what's going on, okay? Well, let me hit that. So now that's all the clear observations over that pixel. So now what do I do with that? You know, you know you've, got a, you've got a good point there because w what we got here, I think, is we used technology and engineering to kind of get us this information. So what do we do with it next? What, what, what would you do? What would you apply to this to be able to understand what's going on? Idea? More dots. more dots. We could put more dots. But we only have so many observations because we had to take the imagery. You could do color. How about if we, what, what's another part of STEM? How about if we take some math and we fit it to a mathematical model? And what does it tell us? Well, it said this is a pretty stable activity from about 2002 back to 1984. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, re really, what, what I think happened here was it just changed. There was something going on here, and then something happened, and then it changed to something else. So when you're looking at every pixel, potentially, of 30 by 30 meters over the land surface of the Earth, these are the kinds of models that we're now looking at to understand where these transitions are occurring. We may not know by looking at the data what caused that transition, but it sure points us toward a point in time or a point in space where something happened. So let's look at what it might look like. So here's a place called Fort Collins, Colorado. So back in the 80s, there was some activity and it was a crop field. We know that by looking at the imagery. Something changed and they started growing hay. So we get a different. Then over here something happened and it converted and it became something else. So you can see the power of being able to go back in time on a pixel by pixel basis across an area to understand what's, what's happening. So what, what did it become? It became a set of buildings for the USGS in Fort Collins. So we know that because we got people there, okay? So that's a perspective. Now let's, let's look at what this looks like when you're looking at an area. So here's an image, 1984. This area is called the Prairie Potholes region of the central part of the United States. It's in North and South Dakota. I live in South Dakota. So this is uh, part of the world that we're familiar with. So our algorithm is able to go in and characterize, classify what each of those pixels is. So let's see, let's hope this. So you can go through time and you can see what happens with uh, in the 2000 time frame, again in 2010, there's more water. We can focus in on an area. Again, here's some of those um, center pivot irrigation. Look at all that water. Come back out, and it's just running through, but what we're able to do is look at space and time. The goal is 
to be able to take the imagery that we take on a daily basis, which is about a thousand images from around the world using Landsat, and then just continue to add those on so that we will have a continual flow of the information and we will keep that in an archive available to the world at what? No cost to anybody, anytime, anywhere. So basically here we're just flying a route, if you were flying down an airplane, through time and space, this is what you might see. Okay, let's see if I can get the... So how do we use that? This image was made with several hundred thousand Landsat 7 images. I told you earlier that we got away from charging for the imagery. To be able to do that with several hundred thousand images would have made it unaffordable. But this is a depiction of the forests around the world. So you can see some red areas where the forest has degraded. Green is where it's pretty much stayed the same. You, it'd be hard to see the blue areas where it's, it's um, actually increased. But that's been done on a pixel by pixel basis using Landsat imagery. So the kinds of things we can look at, I've talked about land cover, uh, understanding water resources as we saw, saw those blue areas come in and out of that, uh, of that imagery. Um, ideas of, of how we respond to human health. Okay, now here's the last part. You gotta give me three and a half minutes, okay? You think you can do that? We're gonna talk a little bit about natural disaster management. So how do, uh, what's another application besides tracking the land cover and some of these things? It is to be able to respond when something happens, to be able to recover after something happens. What are those some things? Floods, earthquakes, um, tor tornadoes, fire, okay? Earthquake. Earthquake, there you go. So let's see if I can get this to, and this is the International Charter for Space and Major Disasters. Almost every week a natural disaster happens somewhere around the world. We often watch them unfold live on the news, when forests go up in flames, when settlements collapse after an earthquake, and roads and bridges are torn away by landslides, when volcanoes erupt or severe floods wash away our communities under torrents of water. When major disasters threaten, the lives of thousands can be put at risk. Time is of the essence, and rapid, accurate data can be crucial, particularly if search and rescue teams have to access very remote terrain. Today, satellites are some of the most helpful observers on our planet. From orbit, they can see through the clouds, detect storms and fires, and even reveal the slightest movement in the Earth's crust, literally anywhere in the world. However, satellites are always moving. They pass over a region affected by disaster for only a few seconds, and return anywhere from hours to days later. It is unlikely that a single satellite would be in place to witness a disaster when it happens. But there are many satellites circling our planet, each on a different track and capturing different views of our Earth. The chance of getting the perfect picture of the disaster zone is much higher if rescue teams can combine all of these views and pick the best of them. This is the idea behind the International Charter Space and Major Disasters, founded in the year 2000 by the European, French and Canadian space agencies providing the best available satellite pictures to help with disaster relief and recovery anywhere in the world, and doing it without expecting anything in return. Today, more countries from all around the world have chosen to commit their satellites to help provide the information necessary to understand the impact of major disasters, what has happened, who has been affected, and how to respond effectively. And every country in the world can access this information through the universal access the International Charter offers. An earthquake in Asia. One satellite has provided a high-resolution image of the area before, and another satellite passes over just after the tremor. The images show where homes and villages have collapsed, and where roads have been blocked by landslides. Rescue teams have up-to-date information in hours, helping them decide how to access the affected area and where they can do the most good. A volcanic eruption in Africa. 
special satellites are configured to observe the lava, smoke and dust and to deliver high-resolution maps of the affected communities. Experts can accurately assess whom to evacuate and where to establish a safe refugee camp. Flooding in Europe. A satellite gauges the amount of rainfall, while another measures the rising water level through the clouds. Yet another satellite delivers the latest map of affected areas, while others track the next storm brewing over the horizon. Citizens can be warned, trains stopped, roads closed, dams fortified, to help manage the worst of the water. We cannot prevent natural disasters from happening, but we can help to manage their consequences. Satellites provide rapid, accurate information anywhere around the world, 24 hours a day. The International Charter Space and Major Disasters is helping to save lives wherever disasters strike. Whenever that finishes, my arm is tired from having drawn that, okay? Oh, yeah, okay. No, so, so now you're all experts on the International Charter for Space for space and major disasters. The applications from satellites, as you found out, are far-reaching. The systems provide us information. How we take that information and what we do with it is up to us. It's going to be up to uh, the group of the young people here uh, in this room and uh, going forward. So last quote, last, almost my last slide. For man must rise above this earth to the top of the atmosphere and beyond. For only thus will he fully understand the world in which he lives. Now, how many people would say that's something somebody said in the last couple of weeks? It hasn't been in the U.S. election system, so don't worry about that. We could, we could think maybe since the advent of uh, satellite systems that that quote was put there. But the inspiration of this is that it was done 2,400 years ago. Someone named Socrates, he was a philosopher who lived in Greece, and he thought about this, and he had no idea that there'd ever be a thing called a satellite. But he knew that getting up above and looking down was going to make a difference. So we do that. We go up above, we look down, we look around, we look to the past so that we can learn about what we're going to do in the future. So my challenge to everybody here is this is the coolest job ever. Come on, you're all welcome to join me. Thank you.